All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the assignment. And the assignment is now visible. Don't ask why there's pizza. There's a reason. Um, number one, it's a group assignment. Max, three members. Uh, if you want to fly solo, that's fine. You're just going to make life hard on yourself because you want to have a second eyes to check your work, which is why group work is a good idea. Um, two, you have two weeks to do it. Three, next week is work periods for it, the whole week. There's no lecture. It's work periods. Therefore, if you're having problems, I'll be here. Uh, and for if you're doing fine or you feel comfortable, then you don't need to come. Just so you know, there won't even be a recording. I'll be showing up in a t-shirt and, well, pretty close to how I'm dressed right now. Um, depending how warm it is. Um, telling the truth. So, essentially, what's happening is you are going to design, although this writing is tiny, but you guys can all see this now because it's now been made visible to you. And I'm going to have to double check after this is done to make sure that everything is still uh, easily legible. So, it's a fictional scenario, but it's a real pizza shop, just so you know. Um, I don't know if any of you have uh, ordered pizza recently. Like us college students, odds are most of you even buy pizza. Uh, it's like basically college fuel. And... Basically put, if you've ever ordered pizza and or worked in a restaurant, you know when they order a pizza, you get to put toppings on it. You get to decide how much toppings. You get to, you have to say where it's going if it's being picked up, blah, 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 blah. So what you're going to do is you're going to design. And I've always had a hard time finding a topic for you guys because every year I pick a topic and there's always a group of the group that doesn't get it. So I'm figuring food is probably safe. People know how to eat. Um, most cultures have customizable food of some sort. So... We're going to go with pizza. So you're going to design a database. You're going to do a conceptual diagram. And then, and there's a typo. Damn it, already. It's supposed to be a physical diagram. It's right in my description. It's wrong. Um, I'll fix that before, it's before the end of the class today. And I've provided you with three pieces. Actual pictures of the guy's pizza, pizza menu. By the way, he's probably got the best pizza on the West End, just so you know. He's just up the road from here. Um, so the front of the menu, back of the menu. So you have an idea of what kind of products he sells. And, you know, you can decide how things are customized. And I provided a receipt. And that's a real receipt. I don't know, I took a picture of it. Uh, so at one point I spent 35 bucks on April 14th on pizza. Just so I'd have a receipt just for you guys. Like I'm kidding. Like, but seriously. Um, so you've been provided with real documents. Uh, the only thing I did is I censored out my cell number. I don't need you guys calling me. Um, so the basically what you're going to give me two diagrams. A conceptual, which is the one with the squares and the triangles. And then you're going to give me a logical slash physical diagram, which is a fully described, ready to go. And essentially, you need to be able to track the following things. What products, what the options are for the products, the orders, and the items on the order. And as the menu gives you, it shows you every version of a product option you could do, one way or another. Um, and it shows an order and how the order was put together. So... Literally, you have all the doc documentation you need to do it. Documentation. So, the assignment's 30 points out of 30. I don't make assignments out of 125 points because that's dumb. I don't, need a, I don't want to have a calculator when I'm finished grading your assignment. There is a rubric attached to this, but mostly the rubric goes from 0 to 5, as in, yeah, you did it, no, you didn't. Um... The conceptual ERD is worth five points because it's fairly simple. Does it show all the important entities? Does it show every, how everything's connected? Since there's no attributes, there's none of that in there, it's only worth five points, but you should be able to demonstrate all the major pieces in there. And then you've got the physical diagram. 
worth 20 points. Obviously worth significantly more. Um, did you create the tables and the columns? That's five points. Did you have create appropriate data types? Uh, are your naming conventions being followed? For all of you who have been ranting about my naming conventions, I've told you and I've told you more than once. And if you don't remember what they are, they are at the end of slideshow week two. Last slide. And worst comes to worst as usual, I'll probably have to post some of the announcements because people are still not going to remember. Are the relationships defined properly, as in, are the one to many is going in the right direction? Are, is everything connected the way it should be? Five points. Application to design theory. Did you cover all the basics? This is my, this is my fuzzy grade part. As in, did you miss anything that was obvious? And is it properly normalized? As in, did you break it down to its most logical conclusion? If you give me a design with four tables, you're going to lose pretty much the last five points automatically. There's no way to do this in just five tables. No way. Not even close. It's probably closer to eight or nine, just so you know. So that's the assignment. So the way it works is you have two weeks to do it. Next week, like I said, is the work period. So you'll get to come in and if you have questions and work through it. No, I will not help you with the assignment this week. That's why I have work periods next week. Um, and, and then after that, what happens is there's the one week grace period thereafter. What does that mean? That means you have a week afterwards to take a 10% penalty. In other words, if you're late, I'll take 10% off the top. Not 10% off your score, literally, if it's out of 30, you're losing three points automatically. Done. 10% gone. Um, and if it's more than one week late, you won't even be able to submit. Automatic zero. Which sucks if you have, since this is group work. That means three of you get zero, which makes my life easier. The less I have to grade, the better. Uh, I'm kidding. I'd rather have everybody's submissions, but, you know, there's always that handful of people that won't submit. Um, now, the problem is I can't see what it looks like as a student in, to enroll into a group. I think it's somewhere under groups, and you can enroll in a group. There's already a section called Assignment 1. You'll see groups 1 to blank. You are actually able to rename your own groups, theoretically. Um, don't sign up to a group that you've, you know, if you, once you've decided who your partners are, look up for an empty group, and then, you know, do you guys agree which group number you're going to be, and then you join that. Don't start hijacking other people's groups. You laugh. Every year, I've got, I've got people like two years before the duty going, this person just joined our group, I don't know who they are. Really? I look at the last time they logged into Brightspace, that was the first time they logged in in three weeks. Oh, shoot, I got an assignment due. I guess I'll join a group and not do anything. Um, if, and to continue with the politics, because I actually really dislike group work, specifically because there's always a lot of politics involved. You group up with people you think are going to do a good job, and you discover they spend the entire week or two playing Fortnite. Or PUBG. Or you know, they've been lost at the local corner store playing Magic. Insert whatever they, they're addicted to here. And then they send you Insta uh, Snapchat saying, yeah, dude, I'm not going to be able to do the work. If that's the case and they don't contribute, provide proof to me and they will get a zero. I'm seeing it now. I've done it before and I will do it again. No, you're not going to get a bonus for doing all the work yourself, but your teammates are going to get zeros. So that's, the, that's the, the big doom and gloom warning right off the bat. So any questions about the assignment before I proceed to the next topic? Hey, It's good. Going once, going twice, three times, done with the assignment. All right. Uh, that's too noisy. Let's go this way. Okay, you don't see it yet. Starting next week, test one will suddenly become available to you. I'm still in the middle of tweaking it 
I'm glad I actually I procrastinated all weekend and I didn't. But I actually noticed I didn't. I didn't touch the dates. It just so happened my dates were correct for me to be able to procrastinate all weekend. Um, the test is mostly complete. I had problems with the new questions I was trying to put in. Some unknown reason Brightspace did not like my questions. Wouldn't work. So a big chunk of my old test has come back from the dead. Yay. Um, it is a take home test. This is where basically put, I ask you guys to you know, do the honest thing and do it on your own. Yes, there's going to be a whole group of you sitting together and be building, doing the test as a group. That's life. I've asked yet you don't. But there's not like I can prove that you didn't. Um, it's online. You can stop, save, and resume. It is open book. Because in the real world, you have Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo or whatever. You also have access to all the documentation provided to you by your company. Therefore, I'm not a big fan of non-open book tests. The only part that's still up in the air right now is the final exam, the, the theory exam. That might still be closed book, but by then, if you don't know the material, there's no hope for you anyways. Um, but on that, the test will go live next week. I've got it set to give you guys an announcement. And it should tell you when it goes, but it looks like I've got it set to go off at 5 o'clock. So right after next week's work period, the test goes live. So I can't have people sitting in the work period asking questions about the test. That's not what it's for. Um, you will, like I said, you've got one whole week to do it. You have until the start of the um, next lecture to do it, get it done. So you get one week minus two hours, which is fair. Uh, you get one try. One try because it's a test. It's not a hybrid. It's not a lab. You do it. You submit. You find out how you did. End of story. All right. Any questions about test one? It basically covers everything we covered till last week. Just so you know. For those of you that want to know what's covered, day one, the end of week four. Today's not on there. Why? Because there's no matching slides or required reading. So, or recommended reading. Eh? No. There shouldn't be. Uh, I will double check that. Hang on, I'll check it right now. So, what, the next thing I'm going to talk about is common patterns you find in data. And this is stuff normally you want to deal with on a regular basis and not make mistakes. Common things are, you know, names or credit card information, addresses, that kind of stuff. I'm going to go through some of the common ones that you see on a regular basis. And, you know, how should you handle this data? This is actually a very practical lecture compared to some of the other, the other stuff, which is, you know, nebulous. This is very straightforward. All right, I always start with names, people's names. And as a rule of thumb, there's two ways of handling names. There is the... Single field, so that single field name would be, you want to put, take a person's name, you don't care what their first name or their last name is, you want to give it enough room, and that's a very straightforward concept. And that one there is normally, you're going to use a, a var car for that, a, very, a character varying length field. And you probably want to give it lots of room because some people like including their middle name. They actually get offended if you don't include their middle name. Some people have really long names. So honestly, you can give yourself 100 in there. That's more than enough for most people's names. Unless, you know, you have examples of longer names than that, then you give yourself extra room. But you know, normally that's good enough. Single field name. The other normal way of handling names is breaking it down into multiple pieces. And depending where you come from in the world, you may have only one name. Or you may have two names. Or you might come from Puerto Rico and have like 14. It's just how it is. However, the most common way to break them down is first, 
And last, holy crap, my handwriting's bad today. What the heck is that word? First and last name, that's the most common way you'd break it down. Most people have a first name. Several people have a last name. And for these, you can usually get away with a Varkar. Honestly, usually about a 40 is enough for most people's names. If you have need more than 40 letters for a person's first name or last name, they've got a really long name. But 40 or 50 is usually good enough. Uh, Yeah, so they'd be Varkar 50, 40 for each. That's usually more than enough. It's almost as much as this, uh, broken down. Um, now, there's sometimes you'll get their middle name. And this, you've got a couple of choices. You can either, again, give you a Varkar 40, so you have enough room for most people's middle names. You can choose to do only one letter. Uh, does anybody in this room have more than one middle name? One, at least one, right? So how would, how would you feel if you had to pick which middle name initial you were going to give? Exactly, but you're being discriminated against. So the other choice you have is to allow middle name initials. And this one you could actually just do as a Do a Varkar 3, that way they can put it up to three initials if they want. That way you're covering first name, last name, whatever. And then we have the special people, the juniors of the world, the doctors, the engineers that insist on throwing extra crap behind their last name. Well, the juniors, I feel bad for them. Oh, you got the, the third and the fifth. I actually know somebody who's on like their, the fifth. You're the seventh. Congratulations. You're even specialer than my friend is. Uh, so at that point, you actually, you don't even put in a suffix anymore, do you? Because there's no suffix for the seventh. Um, normally, the suffix is very industry specific. Um, often, people don't bother with junior to track whether or not they're junior, the, you know, the third, the seventh. You know, the whatever it is you are. Um, unless it's specific to an industry where it's suddenly you'll have a drop down for their suffix, where you have the option for junior doctor, blah, blah, blah. And what happens if they're a junior doctor? I'm, I wish I was kidding. Uh, I've run across that. And normally at that point, you know, you either use a drop down for that or you uh, just give them a field where they get to type whatever the heck they want. But that, that, those cases are rare. Those are edge cases. Um, another thing you'll have is the title in front, Mr. Mrs. Insert whatever the heck you are here, because you know there's like half a dozen traditional and like 50 new style. Let's go with. Um, but usually, if you're handling names, this is it. Uh, Varkar 40 if you're breaking it down to separate pieces. Varkar 100 if you're using a whole name. There's advantages to both, so just so you know. This one here is easy for input because it's only one field. You don't need to validate one field. You know, it is what it is. But if you need to search by a person's last name or just part of a name, the broken down one's easier. Can you say, well, search in last name only? This one, on the other hand, is a little harder because you have to use uh, pattern matching. And there's not always a guarantee the pattern you pick is going to be good. Uh, specifically, if anybody here has a name that has a space in it. Anybody here have a name with a space in it? It'll be my first group ever. Yes, one. You have like a name, space, a name, space, a name, right? Or your, one of your, for your first name has a space in it or your last name has a space in it, right? So if I was pattern matching, well, how am I supposed to know which space it is? I'm supposed to use to match. So it's a pain. Um, so you're better off if you, want, if you think in the future you're going to want to match on parts of a name break it down. It'll make your life easier right off the bat. Okay? Now. I 
That should give me enough room. Um, the next one we normally play with is phone numbers. I'm going to turn on some more lights because my camera just sees a black blob of Dan. Oh, that's why it's black blob of Dan. The lights are gone out. Okay, the next one is phone numbers. Phone numbers are easy and hard at the same time. Now, why is it easy? If you're only dealing about one country, it's simple. Or so you think. In North America, how many different ways is there to write a phone number? There's lots of different ways, and everybody types it in a little differently. Right, but the three components of a phone number here is an area code, the exchange, and the actual phone number. Now, for those of you that don't know, area code is the first three digits, the exchange is the next three digits, the phone number is the last four digits for North America. Um, most people see this as a single phone number. So most people will see, you know, 613 and after 613, everything else is a phone number. Technically, yes, Techni but I, yes, psychologically, technically wrong. But most people treat it as a single thing. Now, the problem we have with this is how people write these, right? You'll see it written as, Just show there's a space. There's more variations than this. But, you know, I just did five variations. And it kind of sucks. Because if you need to search on these, it gets kind of difficult. So, a common way of handling this, there's two ways of handling it. One, you can choose to just store it as is, as typed in, such as life. The other choice you have is to store it without any special characters. Um, this is actually really common. As typed, in it goes. And you want to handle the worst case scenario. So if we count how many characters in here is one, two, three, four, five. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 characters. Worst case scenario. So if you're going to allow the data to go in as is, you can get away with a Varkar 16. On the other hand, if you just want to store just the digits, you can do a Varkar 10. Now, here comes someone. I'm waiting for that one person in this group that's going to say, so, I'm going to be shocked. How about if I store it as a number? No. Never ever store a phone number as a phone number, as a number. Because uh, often you'll see it, they'll do it their database design. They're all proud they're going to store the phone number as an integer. Good job. You'll never be able to search through it. You know how hard it is to search the middle of an integer for 555? Five, five, five? How, do how do you search the middle of an integer for 555? Five, five? You convert it to a string, then you search. So if you're going to do the convert to a string, Store it as a string. Always you char use character. The other reason why you want to do this is if you use numbers and you try to feed that into it, 613, 555, and you have a brackets, it's going to multiply it. Then it's going to do a subtraction because it's going to treat it as a mathematical expression. So, yeah, no. So the other problem you have is once you leave your little nest of your home country, and you need to store international phone numbers. There's nothing quite like 
plus zero four zero. I'm calling the UK. And then they store their numbers differently. Their dashes are in different places. The brackets are in different places. And depending where you are in the world, the way your number is formatted in your phone book is different. So if you have to store international phone numbers, bump this guy up to 25 just to be on the safe side. Um, the only other thing that goes after this past the phone number is what's the other kind of piece of a phone number that you often see? The extension number. Often I recommend don't store it with this number. Provide an extra field for it. So you have a field called phone that would look like this. Usually five is enough. Here at the college, I think our extensions are five digits long now. Um, I've seen them up to six digits long at the, in the government. Because the first digit is what office they're in. You know, the first two digits tell it route to this, to this subsystem, and then after that, it's an extension number. Um, phone numbers suck for a variety of reasons. But as a rule of thumb, always store it as a character. Store the extension separately so that you can search a phone number easily. All right, now. This, this recording is going to be all over the place. Email is my next one. And I've already did the chat with you guys about how long you should store for an email. So honestly, for email, VARCAR 100 at a minimum. Don't even do 50, that's not enough. 75 is barely enough. A VARCAR occupies only the room of the number of characters. So email, VARCAR 100. That's an easy one. Don't even think about it. It is what it is. Um, some people try to get clever where they do, you know, everything in front of the at sign, then everything after the at sign. That's just dumb. You're just making your life, you're making the programmer's life harder than it needs to be. So store the email address as a single field. Varkar 100, life is good. Which leads me to the final one. Well, not quite the final one, but one of the last ones for this topic. Addresses. Remember I was talking for weeks now, I've been talking about how addresses are brutal. Addresses. Now, let's think about what makes up an address, for starters. All right, so you have, well, the street number only if you're Canada Post or your local postal agency, depending where you're from. However, normally you'll want street, street two, Street 1, Street 2, people call it Address 1, Address 2. So that'd be 1, 2, 3, some street, apartment 25, suite 500, P.O. Box 36. You don't normally want it all in one line because it, it just looks gross. Um, depending on what part of the world you're dealing with, sometimes you need three addresses. But that's, you know, that's rare. Well, often what you'll see is you'll have some, some, something street concession 12, box six. It's pretty terrible. That, in that case, people will just put it in, in the second add a street field. You always need to know what city it's going to. Why? How else is going to get there? Region. Also known as province, state, county, and I know there's a half a dozen more. I know France has a weird name for theirs, and you know different parts of the world have different names for other countries divided. But those are the three big ones that you normally see. So, are regions that these? 
After that, you have a postal code. It's like I forgot how to write today. Postal code. This one I'll be addressing in a few moments. Every country has these for the most part. Uh, there's a handful of Pacific that don't have postal codes because it depends on what island you live on. So your region is the island, and then there's like 25 people there. So everybody knows who you are. Yes? No postal codes. So just those of us that are used to having postal codes, you know, there's his example. I've got good examples in this group, right? I've got a seventh, and I've got a no postal code guy. i got a person with spaces in their names, people with more than one middle name. They're the the group of exceptions. This is fantastic. And the last one is your country. Because you've got to know if you're sending it out of your home country, where's it going? Okay, now, there's a few ways to handle this. Now, street one, street two. I'd say to use 100. Why? Because it's not going to cost you anything extra. 100 is enough. Now, some people will say, well, why do you even put a limit on it? It's just proper design. That's all it is. is yeah, theoretically, I could make all this VARCAR 255s and, you know, not have to think about my data structure. But a lot of applications look at these sizes and they actually determine what, how things should behave. And it also forces the programmers to actually follow the rules. All right, city. Normally I give 50. That's usually enough. Um, in some countries, they actually have more than one city line. Or they give you a really insane length on this. For example, in the UK, they actually have two lines for cities. You can't have up to two lines for a city. You'll have some shire near, some Shropshire. They're saying that you deliver to this town, but it's near this town. Why not just say this town? Because in the UK, many towns are called the same. They got a lot of small towns and they all have the same name. So how do you know what, which small town you're talking about? You, which one's the next closest big town? And that's just how it is. So in the UK, their city field is actually really big. It allows carriage returns, just to be safe. Um, other countries, you know, they don't even give city names. Island number. <laughs> You know? <laughs> so, well, yeah, but when we mail from the international, we need actually more information. So I'm not sure how we'd mail to your home country. Nice. Uh, it's a bit like when you talk about cities and how ad mailing is complicated. Um, in Canada, before we go my hometown shared the same name as a town in Manitoba. My hometown used to be called McPherson. There's also McPherson, Manitoba. The rail line rolled through my town. Most of my town's mail ended up in Manitoba. And then they'd send it back this way. So you'd go to Manitoba, realize they belong there, and send it back to McPherson, Ontario. So after a while, they got tired. They just gave it a different name. Uh, but, you know, these are complicated in a different way. I'm going to skip region and country for the time being. And I'm going to talk about postal codes. Postal codes. That depends on where you are in the world. Normally you want to use VARCAR. Why? Because depending on how you decide to store the addresses, you'll need letters and numbers. In some countries, postal codes are just numbers. I know if I remember in China, postal codes are just numbers. A set of digits. I'm probably saying in India, right? Bangladesh, same idea. So you just got to block a number. Other parts of the world, we try to get clever, and we use letters and numbers to give ourselves more postal codes. 
Because you know, when you use base 26 numbers, you have a lot more options. So how long is the postal code in China? How many digits? Six. And in India? Six. OK, so you guys are using the same system, essentially. So at a minimum, six. Six would cover Canada. Six covers the UK. Six covers you know, the two most populous countries in the world. You need five for Australia, the four for Bangladesh, so you know a few characters and less required. So right now, six is looking pretty good until we talk about the stupid Americans, because they screwed up their postal system years ago. Somebody thought they were clever and didn't realize the concept that a city could have 10 million to 50 million inhabitants. Now, the people from the most populous countries in the world know that's like a small town. Right? I'm kidding a little bit, but not really. Um, so what they had was five digits for a postal code, and then they ran out of postal codes. I think I talked about that last week or two weeks ago. So really, at a minimum, you need is 10. But you're safe going to at least, you know, to 12 in case the Americans need to add more digits. And this will let you store your postal code whichever way you want. Like in Canada, you know, you got letter, number, letter, space, number, letter, number. So really it's seven, right? But a lot of systems, they don't allow the space, so they, they do six. So I hate that when they tell you, pull punch in your postal code, and they say, oh, you can't put a space in your postal code. Well, that's how they're written. But they won't let you put a space. Let the programmer strip the space out. No. So postal codes. Give yourself 10. That's usually more than enough. In case somebody gets creative, they need to have more, you know, give them another two. But 10 is good. Now, region and country. I bet you're wondering, well, why did he not talk about those yet? Because they shouldn't be text fields except for one case. If you only allow the two character ISO standard code for each region and country. So your choice is either My hand is not keeping up with my brain. <laughs> US, CA, insert thing here, ON, NL, MA for Massachusetts. Take your pick, FL for Florida man. Take your pick, but two characters. Is the only time you allow them to actually type in this. Now, you'll see this a lot more in systems where a lot of international stuff happens, where you ship overseas on a regular basis. Um, because the other way of handling this is with reference tables. So instead of a car two, region would be going to another table and in here you'd have a regions table with you know insert other area areas in here now this gets complicated cuz this is all pointing to different countries right now so you end up needing a countries table And in here, you'd have Canada, US, France. And in here in the regions, you have to have a reference to the countries also. So it's a significantly more complex data structure. So this would be structured as ID, name, country ID, and out here you have ID and name, so that each of these regions are attached to a country. That means that somebody needs to maintain this list of regions. Somebody needs to maintain the list of countries. And as many of us in here know, the list of countries changes on a regular basis. 
There's that little period when Yugoslavia was self-destructing and they turned into five countries. There's times where other countries have merged or countries take over other countries for a while and then they become, then they separate again but they have a new name. Or you have countries that change names because they feel like changing uh, Myanmar, for example, where it keeps going back and forth between what it want to be called depending on the power. Every time the military take over, it becomes one thing. When it, the military gets kicked out, they become something else. Um, so this is actually significantly more complex to maintain because it's work to maintain. Like every once in a while, we'll, we'll get something at work because we have this kind of a system at work because that's what our ERP system used to us, this kind of structure. And every once in a while, they'll say, well, we're trying to mail it to this country, but it's not showing up in the system. Go look it up on Wikipedia. Oh, this country was formed three weeks ago. So this is okay if you want a complicated solution. Car 2 if you want to make it easy. Because if they can only type in two letters, it's what it is. Now, just so for some nightmare stories, uh, where I work, when I took over the databases, this was uh, years and years ago, for their main website, the region field was a Varkar 25. And people could type in whatever the heck they wanted. And then they asked for reports to be run. And same thing with the country. It was a freeform field. Do you know how many different ways of putting in United States of America? There is. US, U dot S dot, let's do the A dot. United States of America, United States. US of A. And we saw them all. So whenever they need me to run a report, I actually tried to find every variation of people typed into the system. It sucked. Um, and I can just go with United States, but guess what? There's more than one country that starts with the United States. Same thing with the regions. We used to see ON, Ontario, ONT, because for a while Canada actually had three character provincial short codes until somebody realized it was a stupid idea because you didn't have a third character, except for Newfoundland. Because they used four, NFLD, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Now they're just NL, Newfoundland, Labrador, NL. And PEI, because PEI is special. Because it became, you know, P they always wanted to be PEI because it's the name of the island. It's Prince Edward Island, PEI. But they had to shorten it down to PE. So CAR 2 is for your region and your country unless you need a fully nicely described list. And there are ways to make this possible to still be a drop down where you store the two character, two character letters and the nice name. So at least for the countries, you can force them to at least pick a country that's recognized until somebody feels like they've been excluded because their country is not on the list or they feel offended because their country was, you know, or it's, it's in the drop down, but now they took it over. So, you know, but it's, this, this is work to maintain. That's not, it's your choice what you do with it. Like I won't penalize you when you design and you use either of these structures, but they're both valid structures. Um, now, the last piece I'm going to talk about is not fields per se. And this one's actually important towards the assignment, just so you know. Is a very common pattern you find in business. So if you're writing business systems, this is a pattern you see on a regular basis. And then those that need to run away can run away. That it basically put, when I was going through school, my system design analysis prof called this the V. And the V was as follows. Holy cow, dead A, Dan. That was the common V. 
customer to order slash invoice, the items on the order slash invoice, the items are populated from a product that you get from a supplier. So remember, if you think back to that lab where uh, the normalization lab, uh, yeah, the normalize, not the normal, the one before where I've got you doing the uh, lab three, where I've got you going through identifying, you know, parts and supplier and stuff like that. If I were to get you to do it properly, that's the structure you'd follow. Basically put, this V always feeds into items at the bottom. Sometimes uh, you have more than one thing that feeds into this, which is normal. Um, and then if you go past the basic V, then it becomes the tree, the tree of business life. And that's, I don't know. Uh, my business system's prof was special. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing as it goes. So it suddenly stops looking like a V and it starts looking almost like a tree because there's branches coming off the top. Yes. That's shipping method. Yeah, I was about to start saying them out loud so that people at the back that can't see it. So originally we had customer order slash invoice because depending on the system, you only have invoices, you only have orders, you have both. Items, products, and suppliers. Now an order invoice not only has a customer, it's got a shipping method, usually a payment term, uh, for those of you that don't know what a payment term is, do you ever buy something, don't pay for 30 days? Or you may have seen the advertising, you know, pay nothing for 30 days, 12 equal payments. Um, pay no interest for 12 months, which, by the way, don't get nailed by those because they're a scam. You don't pay for 12 months, even if you pay... Let's say it's 1000 bucks and you paid $950, they're going to nail you for the 100% of the interest for the whole 12 months. Because that's how it works. Um, so payment terms. Um, other stuff you might see on here is um, sales rep. You might have a shipping person. On and on and on and on. Um, from the basic V, it turns into looking like almost like an ugly bonsai. But essentially, as long as you've got the basic V of customer, order, items, products, and usually suppliers, you've got all the bits and pieces. So essentially, this person is buying these things, these things come out of this list that were bought from this guy. So you see the whole, you know, the life cycle of money for business. And if you want to talk about the assignment one, you don't need to worry about doing it like this, but like for assignment one, anybody here ordered from Domino's recently? Anybody here ever ordered from, Do crap, am I the only one that eats shitty pizza? <laughs> Domino's is like my McDonald's of pizza. Right? Not that pizza pizza crap up there, that's cardboard. Man, I could get so much trouble for saying that <laughs> on the internet, which is gonna go there. <laughs> but if you ever ordered from Pizza Pizza, and you use the app, it actually shows you, dude, this guy is preparing your pizza right now. It actually shows you the name of the cook, in theory. And if it's getting delivered, it'll tell you the name of the delivery, delivery guy who took your order, in theory. So this is what this whole sales rep is versus the shipping person, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is the major data patterns you'll find. I mean, there's tons out there, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're doing media libraries, you know, you got, you'll have, you know, the artists, the songs, the albums, the, you know, the publishers, the, the producing companies, the advertising company. These are all the things that feed into media. Um, if you want to talk about things like Amazon, that's just an insane data structure where they have allocation systems and stuff, which I, you guys are nowhere near prepared for that kind of concept yet. Um, but that's that. So.
Now, just because I don't have a screen on doesn't mean I'm not talking. So, I've put up some basic data up on the board because I said I'd go all the way from normalization all the way to a physical design. I kept this really, really simple just so I'd be able to do it in under an hour, just so you know. Um, if I was doing it on a computer, it'd be a lot faster. Uh, but because I'm writing on the board and diagramming, it can take a little longer because I've got to do it by hand. Now, this is going to look really familiar from the example that I used on the slides. And in here, we have a structure that has order number, order date, customer number, item number, price, and color. And I actually missed a column. Darn. Forgot quantity. There. And now there's quantity. So this is the basic data structure I have. And the first step to do this is normalizing it. And what we want to do is start identifying all the bits and pieces of this. And at this point in time, it's already in first normal form. The only thing that's missing is the candidate keys weren't identified. And if we actually literally go with the example that we had before, we know that this was the candidate key. It was a compound key. Essentially, we can identify any given row by the order number and the item number combined. So that was the initial step that we identified. Because the customer number gets repeated, the order date's repeated, the quantity gets repeated. Actually, the order number gets repeated too, and so does the price and the color. And even the item number gets repeated, but what doesn't get repeated is the combination of the order number and the item number. So the first step to go from, since this is first normal form, this is already in 1 and F. The next goal we want to go to is second normal form. Now, who remembers what second normal form is? Anybody try? Yeah, it's always a silence. It has to be in first normal form. And we have to separate out the, the full dependencies, the functional dependencies. We don't worry about transi transitive until the third normal form. And in this case, when we want to start identifying our dependencies, we know that the order date and the customer number are only dependent on the order number. The price and the color are dependent on the item number. And the quantity is dependent only on the primary key. So at this point in time, we know what the the fully dependent ones are. We also know what the partial dependencies are. So we want to get rid of the partial dependencies. And so we just want things that are fully dependent. So we'd have it broken down as follows. Now this is a syntax that isn't in the slides, but those of you that have taken the time to look at that booklet may have seen this syntax in there. So this is saying that orders is made out of order ID, item number, and quantity, and that the order ID and the item number are the primary key on this table, or at least the candidate key. The next one we'd have is um, an actual fact. I'm missing one here also, which is the, what did I use, customer number? as it stands. The items is made out of
like that. Um, so what we have right now is it's broken down into two pieces. If I could actually write properly, this would go so much better. So we have it broken down into two pieces. There's still some issues though. Um, if we had more customer information. But essentially the item number, the price and the color is one piece. Um, the customer, the order date, and the order number is only dependent on this. So at this point, those are transitives. And what we want to do is get the transitives out. So th since the quantity is fully dependent on this and fully dependent on that, um, but realistically, the customer number and the date may not be, depending on how you want to handle the data, um, especially if we had the customer's name, which I don't. You'd want to break those out into a separate item because the customer number currently is being repeated, the date's being repeated, the quantity and these guys aren't. So this is fully dependent on these. This is only dependent on the order. So we need to get rid of the, what they call the transitive dependency, which is like this. So those are dependent on that. So in the end, this is second normal form, but it's not a great second normal form. What we want to do is go to third normal form. And that probably did not get recorded, but we'll aim the camera here. At least it'll get caught for this, the end. And the goal is we want to actually go to the third normal form. Which includes orders. Order number, item number, quantity, oh that's the wrong one, so order item is order number, items item and quantity. The order itself is the order number, the customer, and the date. Problem is my hand can't keep up with my brain. I keep writing like two letters over. And then you have, um, the items, which is item number, price, and color. So we went from this which is first normal form with some identified partial dependencies to this, which now had transitive dependencies to this, which has only full fu functional dependencies. So the quantity is dependent on the whole primary key. Date and order number is totally dependent on the order number. The color and the price is totally dependent on the item number. Notice in here, I don't have any customer information because I chose not to include it for the ride for this example. And realistically, there really should be another table just for customers. Fixing my typos as I go. And um, well that covers the basics of this. So now what happens after you've done something like this and um, for the assignment, you probably, you may or may not need to do this. It's up to you, depending how your brain works. Because uh, you'll be able to look at the receipt and you'll have an idea how the data is broken down. You'll also see the menu and see how it's broken down. So depending how you envision things, and if you've ever worked in a shitty pizza shop, 
or, you know, a crappy burger joint. Because McDonald's is a good example of another place where you can customize your hamburgers now. Or Harvey's where you get to choose how many toppings you want. And, you know, how much pickles you want in your burger and, you know, how much mustard and stuff like that. You know, the data is broken down. You may want to do this. You may want to give yourself some sample data to work with and then normalize it. So that's third normal form. Now I'm going to erase this board. This should be a really interesting video. So what we do next is the conceptual diagram. And when we look at this, this was actually really simple if I picked it. How many entities did we identify in the end? Three separate entities. So we're going to draw <coughs> three entities. Okay, you know Dan's having a bad day when he can't draw a square. Like such. And now in here, we have identified the order entity, the items entity, and the order items. Those are our separate entities. Now, the other thing we've, we draw when we do a conceptual is The relationship diamonds. Why? Because it gives you a spot to write what the relationships are. And so when we look at an order, an order can have many items, and an item belongs to one order. Depending on what you want to put in here, you have to decide which way you're going to draw the lines. And the way it works is you draw the line from one entity to the other entity. And we have to determine the basic relationship. And at this point in time, technically, it is an ERD. It's the basic one where we haven't even described what the relationship bar is yet. I'm being lazy because I used small diamonds, so I don't have a lot of room for words. But the word has is like the magic word in this. Um, an order has order items, items have order items. Now, often at this point, a lot of people will say, well, this is a conceptual diagram, we're done. Technically, yes. However, you may actually want to actually draw the relationship, the crow's feet. And an order can have many items. A given order item can only be belong to how many orders? Can an order item exist without an order? That means that an order item can have one and must have one, but no more than one order. So now, can an order ha exist without order items? Technically, no. So this thing, an order, must have at least one order item and may have an order item must have an order and can only belong to one order because you can only sell any given one thing once. So I sell my, my, my Lenovo sold me a ThinkPad. That ThinkPad is mine. It's not yours. If you want a ThinkPad, go buy your own. But they wouldn't be the same one they're shipping to you as I got. Therefore, they're separate items. Going the other way around. An item is related how to, an, to the order items. Okay, so an item can belong to many orders. 
Now, is it possible to not ever order an item? Well, theoretically, what happens is you just put one in the store, nobody ordered it yet. So an item may not be ordered yet. Now, I'm saying an item may be sold in more than one order. Or it may not be sold at all. So zero, one, or more times can appear in this table. Now, an order item can have, what's the relationship order items to items? Any given order item, well, any, so I just sold, Lenovo just sold me my ThinkPad, right? So my order line has one ThinkPad. Right, even when you look at the store, and is it optional? Can you have an order line without an item? No. So we have a relationship that looks like this. An order has order items. And now we discovered we should change this to may have. An item may have order items, but on the, usually you just talk about the relationship in one direction, not both ways, because then it gets complicated. Because then you end up having to have like a, a separation in there and explaining which way each one points, and that's gross. Uh, honestly, the symbols take care of the words, to tell you the truth. So this is a basic ERD. It's a conceptual diagram. As you can see, there's no attributes anywhere on here to be seen. Um, if we wanted to, at this point, we could turn it from a basic conceptual to what they call an extended conceptual, which is what I'm going to do, because otherwise I'll forget what I wrote over here. So now what we need to put on here is the basic attributes. When you draw these with attributes, And someday, my hand's not going to write faster than my... Date. So I just fully described my order based on my normalization. The order has an order number, which is its primary key. It has a date and it has a customer number, since that's what we identified as part of the normalization process. The items have an item number, price, and color. And then the order items have an order number an item number and a quantity. So now I've got a extended conceptual diagram. For the assignment, I'm, I, don't, I don't need this level. I need the previous level I'm happy with. This just gets complicated at this point. For, you know, for the conceptual diagram, there's tons of different tools you guys can use to draw them. Draw that IO or Visio or insert product here. There's tons of them that do these. Um, you can even do it on paper and take a picture. I don't care. Um, so this is fully described as it stands. Um, what I'm not covering in here is obviously some more complicated concepts that where uh, there's derived attributes and stuff like that, where uh, if I had the derived attributes, which I'm going to, I can now invent some data, I could have
And I'm just putting these in to show you guys what that would look like. This is a derived attribute. Do you notice it's not a solid line, it's dashed? Derived attribute is drawn using a dashed line when you do an extended diagram. And the other one is if you had an address, that would be a compound attribute where the address breaks down to multiple pieces. It's inside curly brackets inside the bubble. That's how you identify a compound attribute. This realistically, if you were going to do it right, it would actually look like this. Instead of saying this is a compound attribute, you'd actually go Et cetera, et cetera. Do you notice it's an attribute hanging off attributes? This is demonstrate that this is a compound attribute. So I'm actually going to write a little note on that and then probably take a picture with my phone. and derived. I'm not the, you guys aren't the only ones that take pictures of my board. I take pictures of my board. I'll put that on Brightspace, yes, yeah, so you don't have to try to draw it all by hand. So I'm going to get rid of these extra little bits I threw on because I don't want to include those for the ride for the, uh, the final example. Now I'm going to go erase over here and move my camera so it points over here. You know the best part? I have to guess if the camera's pointing in the right direction. I can't see on my screen whether it's aiming right. So it's a good thing I'm going widescreen. Okay. Now we want to change this into a logical diagram, then I'll take the logical and convert it into a physical. Why am I going to do it all at, in, on the one board? It's because it's essentially the same thing, except one includes data types. So I'm going to I'm going to start with orders. Okay, right now everything's mixed matched, mixed case, because it's still a logical diagram. It's not, the naming conventions aren't important yet. I'll be fixing this up as I go. And Okay, so I've got my basic conceptual. What I still need to put in is the relationships because, I mean, my basic logical. 
Symbols stay the same. This isn't changing. Like such, except there's no more diamonds. We got rid of the relationship symbol because this is indicating as a relationship. So now at this point, we have a uh, logical diagram. It has all the bits and pieces that's there. Um, the only thing that's missing is the identifiers for the primary key. Because at this point, we know what the primary keys are. And I didn't give myself enough room. I'm going to redraw that line in a second. I need all my marker. So we've identified ourselves our primary keys and the primary key foreign keys. These are compound keys. Depending on which diagrams you look at, you'll see it as PKFK, or you'll also see it listed as PFK. Pardon? Well, they can be. In this case, th this table, which is not what it is, or this entity is what kind of entity? There's two names for this. It's a weak entity, can't exist without its parents. And it's also an associative entity because it's bridging two tables. So it allows for the many to many. So this is the same as that. It's an associative entity. So yes, this can be part of the primary key and the foreign key at the same time. Primary key, foreign key at the same time. Now, to turn this into a physical diagram, so now at this point it's a logical, it's a fully described logical, we're, you know, it's almost there. We have to make it conform to naming conventions, number one. Number two, we have to exclude any uh, system keywords, as in magic keywords. For example, have you ever tried calling a class in Java class? Exactly, you can't. It's not you can't supposed to, you know, you can't. Um, if you can, like Java is a bad language. But essentially, you shouldn't call things based on what is in a system already. And the next step after that is determining the data type. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna correct my naming conventions as follows. Order is good, order number was mixed case. Holy cow. Customer number. Now, date's a reserved keyword. Now, because date's a data type. So we want to avoid stuff like this. One of the magic tricks you can use when you're dealing with dates and timestamps is a lot of people will put in order date, order timestamp. There is actually a magic trick to keep your field names nice and short, and it actually makes it obvious what it is. Use the past tense of a verb. Ordered. Now, for non-English as a first language people, that might seem a little not obvious. But this is ordered is the past tense of the order, as in you ordered something today. After it's been ordered, it's at a point in time, it implies date and time by default. So you don't need these big long fields to do that job. Ordered, shipped, replaced, deleted, created, modified. A short word, it implies date and time, it's obvious, and it's, it's nice and short. Take my word for it, the developers hate it when you lose really long field names. Because they have to type more. And the other thing is, table names are supposed to be plural.
Now I'm going to point out one more thing. Shortened words like QTY for quantity is okay most of the time. Um, normally you want to try to use the full word unless you know it ends up making the, the field names too long. Um, because some programmers will say, well, it's the quantity field, they'll type in the word quantity. Other guys will go QTY. And if they don't know what your database structure looks like, they're going to guess. So unless this has been documented, you know, you should use the whole word as a rule of thumb. So I'm going to fix this to follow my own rule. Just like that. So at this point, there's nothing to guess because you know what everything's called. Now, that was round one of naming conventions. Round number two is, oh crap, Dan has a rule about his primary keys. What's the rule about my primary keys? Just called ID. Now, I have a rule for my foreign keys. It is the singular version of the parent table name with the name of the primary key. All right, so some of you may be going, okay, well, why is this the naming convention? There's a bit of a logic to this. First of all, if you call the, the primary key ID everywhere, you don't need to guess what the primary key is called. Right, so for like order ID would be okay, you know, item ID would be okay, and in here, you know, repeating those would be fine. But what happens if you have a table called uh, released product versions? So your primary key, key would be called released underscore product underscore version underscore ID, which will be immediately abbreviated to RPV underscore ID. I actually had to think about that for a second. So instead of a big long name, everybody's going to bridge it down to RPV ID. And then people are guessing what your primary key is called. Did he use the long one this time? Did he use the short one this time? We don't know. So we need to go look at the structure of the database. To try to minimize the amount of time you go looking at the structure of the database, you call things consistently. So your primary key is always called ID. And by the way, on the assignment, I take points off for this. Half a point from per mistake. Yes. Okay, that was a stretch, not a question. Okay. Um, so, so far, it's now meeting all the naming convention rules from start to end. Oh, I just have enough time to finish. Good. <laughs> now, data types. The ID right now, I'm doing this specific to Postgres. You could use either big serial or serial. So you know what serial and big serial is, it's what's called a meta type. Um, and you could also think of it as a macro. Do you guys, I know there's people in here that know what macros are. For those of you that don't know what a macro is, it's a tiny little program that does a, a very simp simplistic job. In Postgres, the serial and the, yes. Uh, well, it's big serial or serial, I'd take both. Um, depending on if you use that sample that was given to you guys, which I told you guys to not use, uh, then if you were using lab two, you'd be using serial and big serial. Uh, the only way to get away from not using serial is you have to use identity columns instead. And that wasn't something I, I covered in the labs. Uh, so what serial and big serial does is it actually creates a field that is either an integer or a big integer. So serial becomes Big serial becomes a big integer or an integer eight, an eight bit integer. It creates something called a sequence. A sequence is a clicker. So did you ever, s for those of you that are from around here, have you seen the, the college students sitting in the recliners counting cars? Did you ever notice? Not a lot of people in here have ever seen these guys. You'll, s you'll see them, especially if you go up and down uh, Heron on a regular basis just by, uh, just past the uh, Canada Post building. They're sitting there under their umbrella and they're literally counting, oh, that's a truck, that's a truck, that's a truck, that's a truck. The person next to them is going, oh, that's a car, that's a car, that's a car, that's a car. It's cheaper to actually pay college students to sit there and count than it is to actually 
put in the equipment. Uh, because then, you know, or they're counting brands of cars. Oh, that was a Honda, that was a Honda, that was a Honda, that's a Honda. With the little clicky things, they can't tell what kind of car it is, right? So um, a serial is basically a counting tool. It goes one, two, three, four, five. And every time you ask for a number, that number is no longer available to anybody else. So it's a bit like when you walk into Service Ontario or, you know, whatever, pick your embassy or whatever, and they say take a number and you grab a number out of the little machine. Now that's your number. Nobody else has that number. That's the idea. Okay? That's what serial does. So what it does, it creates an integer of some sort, creates a sequence, and assigns the default value of this to the next value of the sequence. It's programmatic. I can show you guys individually in lab what it looks like in the database. Um, it's a mechanical thing. Ordered. What's my rule about dates and times and stuff? I always use the timestamp. If you're working with MySQL, it's known as date time. Always basically use whatever data type that your database server supports for the full amount of time. So in Postgres, it's a timestamp. You don't need to worry about the, uh, the, the uh, time zone because I've already had one person say, well, you include the time zone? No. Customer number. We don't know where it's coming from. We're going to assume it's an integer. Over here, price. There's going to be a, a number with decimal places of some sort. And some database servers have something called the money type, which is a number rounded to two places. Um, but not all servers support that. So you could use something called a numeric. And my, in my samples, I didn't have a single price more than you know, 39.99, I think was the highest price. So we could literally go four comma two. This means the largest price I can sell is 99.99, $99.99. It's a little short-sighted, but that's what my data had, so I'm gonna go with that. The color. I'm gonna do VARC R25 because some people get creative with their color names. Or maybe it's a two-tone product, puke green with a side of diarrhea brown. It's a nice long description of really bad colors. But those are examples. Now, if this is an integer, because that's what serials are, right? This becomes an integer. That means these guys are going to be integers. And the quantity, do we know? All the examples up I had on the board originally were full numbers, not partials. So again, the quantity can also be an integer. And now, I have a physical diagram. This is rough, mind you, you're using the diagramming tool, so it's gonna have like little keys here and you know extra stuff down the side because the, they're not doing it by hand on the board. But that is a physical diagram. A physical diagram shows the tables as defined. So we went from entities with their attributes to tables and their fields, a slash column, because field and column is the same thing. We have defined the primary keys. We have the data types. We're following naming conventions. Relationships have been defined. It is now a physical ERD. It is completely prepared to be put onto a database server. And that is that.